Right, so I'm Nathan Hill, a professor in Chinese studies, uh, and uh, this is our next um, talk in, in this series uh, that's about uh, uh, Marxism in Asia and Asia in Marxism. And today's speaker is uh, Professor Viren Murthy uh, from the Department of History at University of Wisconsin. Uh, he was educated at the University of Chicago and um, has uh, written I, I will just try and summarize an uh, overview here, written various things about uh, intellectual history broadly, especially in uh, Japan and China. Uh, but uh, today he'll be uh, telling us about uh, Marxism in, uh, let's say in Tamil speaking parts of India. The talk is uh, titled, Back to the Future, Reflections on Tamil Marxism, Anti-Colonial Nationalism, and Identity Politics. Um, I'm going to just share my screen. Um, I've a, I put a bunch of different things together, so I'll, I might have to skip some of it. I've got about five sections and then a conclusion. So first, an introduction, sort of why I'm interested in Tamil Marxism. I mean, what is someone like me who really works on um, you know, China and Japan, what, what, why, why get into Tamil Marxism? Um, and I'm, I'll contextualize a certain debate in Tamil Marxism in relation to a larger question, namely the problem of identity politics. I mean, usually a lot of times identity politics is something that Marxists would criticize. But then, how, but in, of course, Tamil Marxism, one of the interesting things, it's a lot of it is about Tamil identity. So how do they bring these two together? Um, and then in this, there's a debate about Mao. So that may be a slight China connection. Um, I had heard that there was going to be a talk about Mao, but now I guess maybe not um, in the series. But in any case, what I'm talking about now is not, it's, it's not something very esoteric. It's, it's some basic ideas in Mao that there's a debate about basically the problem of contradiction. Then I go into the politics of tradition and then the Asiatic mode of production. I know you've already had a talk. I think it's by Li Shang who has a, it's, uh, did something on the Asiatic mode here. Again, we'll revisit that idea. And in this, in that part, maybe we'll also talk a little bit about, um, you know, certain ways of reading Hegel um, on, on Asia. Uh, and then two sections, one on nationalism and then, and then bringing it together with the kind of traditional what, con contemporary debate. So why Tamil Marxism? So let me say a little bit about my theoretical interest. And so the, the title, Back to the Future, the title of a book that I just finished and should be coming out by the, in the summer, probably the, by the end of the summer. Um, and um, this, in this book, I deal with uh, basically Chinese and Japanese not just Marxism, but, but politics of time is what I call it. Um, and there, I, the first chapter deals with value theory and uh, the way in which value theory can turn into a kind of a modernization theory with a twist. I'll talk about this at the end of my presentation. Um, now, back to the future narratives provide an alternative Marxist theory of the past. And in some cases, they could be an example of theorizing from the global South in some sense, this whole series seems to be about that because it's about looking at Marxism, but also looking at it from not just from Europe and America, but from a larger perspective, right? And, and how do we think about that? And you know, some people have called it deprovincializing Marxism, specifically Harry Haratunian, a Japanese historian, uh, who I'll talk about a little more. So this presentation points out the overlap, um, and this is again going to come at the end between what I call formal subsumption Marxism. This again will come, become clear at the end of the talk, and then uh, Tamil identity-oriented Marxism, and showing how they could be both theoretically vi viable and both have something like back to the future narratives. Now, when I say back to the future narratives, what do I mean? <clears throat> I mean those narratives that go back to a past, but they're actually trying to create a, a, um, a different future and in this context, specifically a socialist future. Now, this is part of a kind of global attempt to unite resistance from the standpoint of race and caste, right? For especially in Tamil Marxism is important and then class. But at a time when these two movements seem to be separate, right? And this is where we often find, you know, even with the global interest in Black Lives Matter, uh, there was little 
in interest in class when we when you thought about this. It's it's something we can also talk about in terms of, you know, what I know not that much about, but what I want to learn more about is something like critical race theory and, and its limits with respect to class. So the debate forms a central theme of the thought, talk, that, that is this debate between sort of identity and class um, and is relevant more glo globally um, where there are different attempts to think race and, and Marxism together. So Tamil Marxism brings together these two aspects, right? So that is identity and class, but, and, but in, in relation to um, these problems of, of, of post-colonialism, right? So there are these two aspects of post-colonialism and one is the critique of anti-colonialism, right? As reproducing capitalist modernity. Now under this, sometimes they have a critique of Marxism, right? So this is, this is, this is of course, there's a big debate between post-colonialism and Marxism that we could also talk about. But the second part is usually the search for alternatives in existing practices. So, and this might be connected to identity, right? And linking them to revolution. And this we see in formal subsumption Marxism as well. Okay. So um, we should keep in mind here also now the, the link between identity politics and, the, and identity and the politics of tradition and language. And that's going to become important in, in Tamil Marxism. So now coming to the, deep, the recent debate. So we have these two Marxists um, that I've been just beginning to read, especially the latter. I've been focusing more on the latter. The, the, the first I'm using more as a foil. So N. Gunasekar and, and, um, and Muttamogan. So N. Gunasekaran is, would be something, he's more of the kind of, you know, orthodox Marxist, maybe more on the modernization theory side. Uh, and then Mutumohan is all is much more about um, this kind of politics of tradition, emphasizing, you know, identity as a, as a possibility of, of, of resistance. Um, and they have a debate that took place around in 2010. Um, now, if we want to contextualize this debate, we have to realize that language here, language, caste, and nation come together. Now, there's a bit of historical background that I have to cover here, and it's not, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but, but um, you know, and, and it's, again, something that has been written about uh, quite extensively. Um, so first, the problem of identity, right? Often this identity, something like Tamil Marxism, or even, you know, this, a lot of the concepts that are that are used in these identity politics is given by the oppressor and here you can think about you know um, missionaries such as robert caldwell who wrote a, a book uh, in 1856 called a comparative grammar of the dravidian or south indian family of languages so this very this book separates the dravidian from the aryan now this is a big debate there's an aryan debate going you know and i'm not going to get into that um, but um, what's interesting for our purposes is that after this point, people could start using Dravidian as a kind of category of, of resistance versus the Aryan. And so this became connected to caste politics, right? The Dravidian becoming, um, you know, that which is the, the, the lower caste, even sort of maybe uh, kind of a politics of equality, an anti-caste kind of movement, an anti-Brahmin movement, especially. Um, and this, this is very evident in the self-respect movement by, uh, E.V. Ramasamy or, or Periyar, as he's often called, right? Um, and so this becomes, uh, this, this then lays the groundwork for a lot of Marxists, right? So, so this opens a space to think about earlier Tamil culture as Dravidian culture, which was socialistic. So there's this idea, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this as I, as I move on, I'll give you a couple of examples. So we'll return to this when we come to the problem of the politics of tradition, or Panpada Arasil. Okay, so both of the Marxists I mentioned, um, so Gunasekaran and Muttamohan are connected to the Communist Party of, of India. Marxists, which, which was something that split from the Communist Party of India earlier, that's an, another history that I won't get into. Um, but Muttamohan is perhaps the more, more eclectic in his Marxism. Now there, there are two earlier figures that are worth mentioning just because they're 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 well known. Uh, there's uh, Singar Avelar um, who leaned towards more towards science. These are he was one of the he was in the you know during the founding of the Communist Party he was he was there, um, and uh, and then Jivanandam who stressed more the politics of tradition. Um, and these are sort of in some sense you know two real pillars of of Tamil Marxism. Um, 
now, so there's the, the debate really is around the role of the past and nationalism in, in, in Marxism, uh, especially the role of the past and identity. So, but we, we have to understand this contemporary debate in terms of some changes in our recent, in Indian, re recent Indian history. And so here, the, the movement I want to stress here is the movement from a kind of state-centered capital accumulation um, to a kind of neoliberal uh, worldview. So basically, you know, the Nehruvian period, which is often thought of as, you know, some people even call it somewhat socialistic, um, that I think is a, is a mistake, but it is, it is more, it was more uh, state-centered and you had like import substitution, all these kinds of things happening um, at the time, right? And then, but you move from that to a neoliberal period, right? And this is especially the case in, with Modi, right? Um, but, you know, many would say with Moraji Desa, it's already starting definitely later. You know, there's, there, this is a big debate. I mean, this is a debate all over Asia. When did neoliberalism actually start, right? Um, but, you know, whatever one says today, we're really in the midst of it in, mo in, a, in a lot of Asia. Um, so um, with this period, of course, there's, there's a huge shift, right? So from the 80s, you go away from uh, import substitution, right? Uh, so this is where you then have, uh, you know, the Coca-Cola was a big thing, right? Because, I mean, I, I left India actually in the 80s and and uh, it was a time when you couldn't actually buy Coca-Cola, right? And that was a big thing, right? And, but, but, you know, it was a big thing on both sides. The left was, oh, look, you know, the state is really doing something. It's, you know, resisting global capital and so on. But, you know, by the 90s, slowly all of this started changing. Um, and this, of course, creates new kind of political, uh, uh, kind of political opportunities and situation, right? And so you have all these critics of, of, of neoliberalism as, as, you know, it's almost like a different form of, of, of imperialism. And this is another debate that, that's big in, in Indian Marxism and something we can talk about because it's, it's at the background of, of, of Tamil Marxism as well. So this of course creates new kinds of inequality um, and is also linked to new kinds of post, any kind of sort of new kind of theoretical trends, right? And this is where the critique of post-structuralism comes in. Um, now, there are these people left behind the development, right? And a lot of people have written about this, right? So you have this idea, the way in which neoliberalism really increases the inequalities and so on that, that, that were existing, um, but is also connected to identity politics. And this is where we come to the context, uh, con uh, content of the debate. So I'm basically looking at a number of essays by Mutumovan and especially it's, it's many of them collected in this book called um, The Politics or Dialectics of Tamil Identity. So, um, or that should actually be the Dialectics of Tamil, Tamil Identity Politics, right? So, Adayala um, Arisiel in Yengil. So he draws on the Tamil past to connect it to class-based movements, right? So the anti-colonial, he's thinking about the re rekindling the anti-colonial legacy in a neoliberal context. Now, Gunasekaran criticizes him from the standpoint of class or the more orthodox Marxism focusing on the economic. Now, this is somewhat different from the value form critique, but um, they're united in their suspicion of an, a politics of the past, right? And he wants to contend that the politics of the past is part of this postmodern neoliberalism. So you can't really use that, right? That, that, that is going to con constantly play into capital is, is the argument, right? And this is something that, you know, Marxists have made this point against post-colonials and so on. Right? So like in my Back, Back to the Future manuscripts, I aim, to re I aim to rescue the politics of the past from the Marxist critique and then reconnect it with the goal of creating a socialist free future. So now let's turn to the pol how the politics of the past you sometimes see in Marx, right? Or the politics of the remnant. Now, one obvious way is here, right? Where he says in, in Capital, right? Alongside the modern evils, we are oppressed by a whole series of inherited evils arising from the passive survival of archaic and outmoded so modes of production with their accompanying train of an an anachronistic social and political relations. We suffer not only from the living, but from the dead the dead, right? The mort saisit la vif. So this is a big, this is clearly at this point where it really, where it sounds like a very mass uh, kind of modernization theory point, point, right? That we've got to get rid of these, you know, these, these out, we're, we're being oppressed by that as well. So we got to get, get rid of them as well, right? It's from, probably thinking of Germany, right? Um, 
now, so this is where earlier extra economic forms persist. So now in this, in, in this debate, we now get to, to, to Mao, right? About, you know, how do we deal with this extra economic, right? Um, and Gunasekaran contends that according to Mao, we have to focus on the fundamental con contradiction, which is economic, and therefore, and one has to get rid of these earlier forms of domination. Um, now, that's, uh, that's obviously that's obviously right, but um, Mutomon's response is to really think about the problem of imperialism and unevenness. So he claims that in Mao's essay, the cure theory of contradiction should not be applied mechanically. There are various types of dialectics at work, at work in contradictions. Um, in an Eastern country, right, or the third world, you could maybe say, right, Kire, Kire not is, could also be considered the kind of lower country. So um, such as China, when one uses theory, one has to be aware of both the universal and the particular dimension of, of contradictions. So, the problem in Mao, he says, and Mao himself talks about this, right? And he says, for instance, in, can in capitalist society, the two for forces in contradiction, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie form the principal contradiction. The other contradictions, such as those between the remnant and the bourgeoisie, and the bourgeoisie are all determined or influenced by this principal contradiction. In a semi-colonial country, such as China, the relationship between the principal contradiction and the non-principal contradiction pre presents a more complicated picture. And this is where he says that at certain times, imperialism could be the main, right? Imperialism, when imperialism war launches a war of aggression against the country, then the contradiction between imperialism and that country becomes the major contradiction. And in this case, you could then say, well, the, the nation form becomes important, right? So that's going to be something we can come back to. So Mutamohan then claims that Mao concretizes a way to ways to create a world beyond economic and non-economic forms of domination. He highlights the importance of extra economic forms of domination by noting that Mao portrayed society as having complex overlapping contradictions, which made it such that the revolution could not merely re rely on the working class. And this is where the other identities have to come in, right? Um, so we see this, This many of you will obviously think of Altus, Althusser here, and, and Mutomohan is also thinking of this and with the concept of overdetermination um, in Eastern society. So overdetermination implies numerous forms of production, which, which we see in various terms that Mao uses, such as interpermeation and so on, right? Which is this different modes of production articulated with one another, right? And so this again brings us to um, the problem of multiple modes, which we'll come to in a second. So, but overdetermination is not the same every, everywhere, even if it, if it exists everywhere. So I think the big question here is what unevenness has to do with this, right? What, how does unevenness, what, what is the role of unevenness here? Um, so let's summarize what we've done so far. So we've got, we now have two different Marxist interpretations of identity politics, right? One, an interpretation of identity politics is postmodern and emerging after the defeat of class politics, right? So that's the critique of neoliberalism and identity politics go together. But then there's the idea Mutomohan wants to put forward, and that is the idea of an identity politics out of the overdetermined relations of colonial capitalist imperialism. So that is where, you know, identity politics before it was called identity politics was existing in anti-colonial anti struggles, right? That's the, the point. Um, okay, so now let's examine the second form of identity politics in, more gre in, in greater detail, right? And this is where we get to the politics of tradition and the Asiatic mode of production. So, so in colonial capitalist Indian society, it is a fact that, that inherited foundations changed, right? So this is where everything is reconstituted. However, the Asiatic mode of production, which has survived for a long time, re reveals itself by influencing identity politics. So this is a very interesting part of the book, an unusual when I first read it, I thought it was kind of, kind of strange, but he brings in the Asiatic mode of production. But then as I read it, I began to think, well, what's he doing with the Asiatic mode of production? And it's really the Asiatic mode of production is really representing um, kind of inherited forms of community. So he says, first, both, first, we could say both Hegel and Marx used the concept of the Orient to show a path different from the West. And that, I think, is the, the, the possibility here. Now, since we have different ways of tackling the concept um, of that, I'm thinking of the Asiatic mode of production, just as with the remnant. So 
the usual mode is negative. The Asiatic mode of production is outmoded. It's anti-freedom, the, or the concept itself has to be disregarded, uh, right? And that discarded. And that's Perry Anderson in his book, uh, Lineages of the Lineages of the State of the Absolutist State. I think. Uh, so recently, um, so people have pro problematized this view. You know, Deleuze and Guattari. Um, sorry, I don't have the Guattari there, but. Um, in, I think it's in uh, Thousand Plateaus or Anti Oedipus, one of those, is, you, they, they try to you know, reuse the concept in a different way. Uh, and Mutomoen is, is sort of similar to this, uh, except he's trying to look at the possibilities of the, the Asiatic mode almost becomes something potentially positive. And if we look at Marx himself on this, there are things we see that we, we look at it from a different perspective, it's sort of nice, right? I mean, there's cooperation in the, late of the labor process that we find in the beginning of human civilization among hunting peoples, a predominant feature of the agriculture of Indian communities is based on the one hand of common ownership of the conditions of production. And on the other hand, the fact that those cases, the individual has little torn himself free from the umbilical cord of his tribe or community as a bee from his hive, right? So, both these characteristics distinguish this form of cooperation from capitalist cooperation. Now, what's interesting here, and this is, uh, you know, what, what's here is that it is, there is something communal about this, right? And, 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 but, you know, common ownership of the mode of production, that sounds like conditions of that sound, that could be socialism as well. So there's a way in which what has to happen is this has to be sublated into something else, right? So if it's sublated and it's, if these things are already there, then, well, that's, that could be something positive. So, so this is where part of the past could turn into the future. So Mutomoen connects this idea of the communal remnants to, to Marx's famous letters about, um, you know, Vera Zaslich, and we were talking, I was talking to Nathan about this in the beginning. Um, it's worth citing a little bit. Um, and so this is where he's talking about these archaic types of communal property. And he says, you know, we shouldn't be afraid of these. We should, we, they could actually, we could actually be drawing on them, especially given that we are in a global capitalist world at this point. Um, now, Harry Haritunian, who I mentioned here in his book um, after Marx, also talks about this. Um, and he says that this is, you know, these are possibilities for a new kind of historical community, right? Um, and that I think is, you know, we can, this is where you have use value and non differentiation of subject and object still prevailed, bringing with it possibilities for a different form of political community. So, this I think is very much, and this is someone who's, or I would call him a formal subsumption Marxist. So we'll, we'll, come, we'll come back to him later. So now let's think about this in the Tamil context. So Mutumohan claims that we need to build on the legacy of previous Tamil activists who themselves revived and reinterpreted classic Tamil literature and philosophy to reimagine socialism. So uh, some of these I'm not gonna talk much about, but you know, I'm, these are people I'm interested in learning more about myself. I mean, one is there's a Buddhist uh, revival at this period by someone named Ayoti Das. Um, and he's written a lot about Buddhist politics, but again, Buddhist politics connecting it somehow to socialism, and that is um, by, you know, sort of, you would call this a kind of utopian socialism, but we have to sort of sublate this rather than negate it. Um, so Jivanandam, who I already mentioned, already began this project, and Mutumon sort of continuing this, right, finding alternative narratives of socialism that, higher, that highlight both the lower castes and the problem of class. Now, Buddhism is important from the standpoint of caste because it goes against the Hindu kind of uh, ideal. And this is where Ambedkar would be important here, right? And, and Ambedkar and Das both sort of connect Buddhism to both the working people and the peasants. Now, um, now in the Tamil tradition, you, there, you'll often find and here again, there's a lot of work um, to be done and I've only sort of scratched the surface, but, but there are examples of how to, you know, um, how, where, what are some of the sources that he's looking at to try to develop socialist ideas? And a lot of people go back to Tirukural, um, right? He's, uh, it's a text by uh, Tiruvallavar, um, and uh, it was, it was um, written around, the, compiled around the third century BC to the fifth century uh, uh, CE. Now, the, the, the passages uh, in Tirukural that um, Mutumohan highlights are the following. 
So one is, um, you know, the feeling of I and mine are not are nothing but vanity and pride. He who crushes them entered the world higher than, the, than that of the gods. So this idea of self-negation, he wants to connect to a kind of communal idea, right? Um, so points to a communal form of identity, but it might appear that we're sa sa sacrificing subjectivity here. So it's like, and this was, of course, Hegel's critique of the Orient. Um, but Hegel also writes positively about this kind of unity beyond the self and and this is where you know we can go back to the Hegel uh, pro problem that I think uh, Statman was talking about. Um, so here, the the you know Chatterjee, Partha Chatterjee makes a, draws on Hegel in a very similar way uh, in, the, in in to to Mutumohan's drawing on on Marx's Asiatic mode of production to sort of flip it and say that you know if you look at the family substantiality, you have this whole discussion of love, which is all about the unity of one consciousness with another, the overcoming of self-consciousness, right? It's not, it's not just my self-consciousness, but the renunciation of my independent existence with another and the other with me. So, so I'm not gonna read this. This is a very nice passage, but I'm not gonna read the whole thing because I think I'm probably taking a little too much time here. But, um, but, but the point here that, that Chatterjee tries to do is to try to flip this and say again here, wait a second, we've got here a kind of socialist uh, potential here, uh, even though Hegel is going to say the problem is that it negates the the individual, and I'll come to that in a minute. So the point here is that is both in the family and that's the description of love and the Asiatic mode of production, we have the substantiality of community um, that, in some sense, could could be something that we could draw. On. The problem that Hegel sees here, of course, is the destruction of subjectivity or the lack of subjectivity, right? Um, and you know, and this is where uh, Mutumohan, is the he here, cites C.L.R. James to sort of, again, citing Hegel, uh, which is where he says the ultimate truth is not just substance, but also subject, right? So, so um, we have to think about the idea of uh, truth, and this is Hegel in the phenomenology. Um, so C.L.R. Citing, citing Hegel, so I'm citing Mutumohan citing C.L.R. James citing Hegel, but but in any case, the point here is Mutamon is trying to break out of a linear narrative where self, the self-interest of civil society and capitalist colonialism are necessary before one can get to, the, to, to unite substance and subject. And so he finds this unity even in, in, in earlier texts. And this is where we have come to Tirukura uh, again. Um, and this is the, um, in the, 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 same, the same text, but um, the saying, um, number 972, where he says, the manner of birth is the same um, for all human beings, but their reputations vary because uh, they differ in the lives they lead. And here, I think the, the real interesting point is this say toril vetrumayaan, which, which is really, which is really toril, toril is actually a term for work. So I could, you could translate it that way, in which the work they do, and that is their, that's their subjective input really puts it differently. But you can, but you can you can then see how this could be mobilized against caste, right? Because in the, in the, the birth they're all the same, right? And yet you know they're, they're, it's it's the work that they do that that that, that changes things, right? Um, and so this is one way of thinking about uh, substance and subject together. Now this is a kind of textual um, kind of uh, critique, but their argument is that you're also you also have practices um, that, that that develop these critiques. So now we've shown how the politics of the Asiatic mode of production, the politics of the remnant and the politics of tradition come together. What these have in common is the use of earlier forms of community against capital, capitalism. And we see this in the, the Zasulich letter. Now in the modern period, especially in the context of empire and imperialism, the form that this takes is the nation. And so now we come to the next section, which is the politics of tradition and nationalism. Now, in this, we often have, um, you know, the question of whether the nation form is going to exist and so on. And, but, but I think the, 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 the real question here in relation to identity politics is um, a kind, the question of how one understands anti-colonial nationalism, right? Um, so a new manner of uniting substance and subject sort of brings us to the problem of anti-colonial nationalism. So after all, part of the task of finding socialism in Tamil classics concerns the construction of a Tamil national identity, but this is not necessarily the, com the construction of a Tamil national state, right? And so that means that this idea of the nation is connected to a larger idea of, of, of Indian socialism, right? 
uh, and eventually, of course, world socialism. So here at the sub-state level, Tamil Marxism, such as Muttamon, are creating a national identity. So he then compares this to the conception, uh, this to, to Otto, Otto Bauer. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Otto, Otto Bauer here, um, because I think he's sort of relevant in his, because he also separates the nation and the state. Um, so if you think of Bauer and Tamil nationalism, um, Bauer actually talks about caste, but he's much more, in, the part that he's probably more interested in is Jewish uh, identity. Um, but that gets us into another uh, interesting topic, but uh, one perhaps for another day. So first, uh, some Marxists had the idea that the nation would become less important as time for, for, for progressed, while Austro-Marxists such as Bauer believed that nations would continue. Now, moreover, and so this becomes a, brings up the whole issue of nations and capitalism, which is another uh, issue that we might want to get into. So moreover, Mutu Mohan focuses on Bauer because he believes that there's an important distinction between Central and Eastern Europe as opposed to Western Europe. And Bauer is thinking a lot about Central and Eastern Europe, right? So Central and Eastern Europe are, are sort of, in, in, in his opinion, I think an interesting idea is that it's more similar to the oppressed nations of the world. So, so you can sort of separate and stop thinking of Europe as, as one unity, right? Okay, so in Central Europe, Bauer is thinking of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which consisted of numerous nations, right, including Hungary and so on, right. Um, and and so the question here again, so the, the the relation to the Indian context is sort of interesting, right. Um, so for this reason, Bauer did not consider language as the basic of a basis of the nation, which might seem to go against one of the pre premises of uh, Tamil Marxism, but but we should not forget that as we've seen, for example, in readings of Kurt, Tirukural, Tamil is actually a culture, right, for, rather than just, so that's why Panpada Arasil is really cultural politics or politics of tradition. So moreover, since Bauer was thinking within an empire, he separated nation from state. So let's look at a couple of sections from Bauer. So, so here, the first citation really from Bauer really talks about a national community of culture, right, achieving self-determination, right, and that's within, so this is all within a state, right? So, so they're gonna, have, so this is where you get sort of identity and difference. So again, again, he's also talking about the, uh, thinking of the nation as cultural rather than territorial, again, separating it from the state. And this he thinks is going against a so kind of imperialism, right? Because imperialism might be, you know, much more, uh, much more of a territorial uh, principle. So this is where you get a different, principle where you kind of, you know, you have the personality principle and so on. Uh, and, and he's interested in kind of the minority groups, right? And that's, that again could, is, is something that I think uh, Mutumon sees and is important for the uh, Tamil position. Okay, so now this type of cultural definition of the nation is of course, I, could be ideal in multinational states such as, such as India where, where you have all these problems of, of, of diversity. And the question of course is how do we think of a socialism that, that is able to you know, uh, respect that diversity. So the Marxist dimension of Tamil Marxism lies in drawing on so-called backward regions to confront capitalism and form, formulate a native, narrative of community. Now in the midst of the discussion of Bauer, Mutumon argues that the nation draws on earlier communal structures and, it, and he plays on, the, on these terms uh, in a kuru, which is like an ethnic community. And, and or, or which is a tribe and an inam, which is which is ethnic community. Um, and here again, he brings back uh, Zasulich, right? So that you can then have you know various versions of Zasulich going on in in in, in one and that, that then somehow uh, connect. So now, summary of this section before moving on to the final section. So the politics of Mutumon's nationalism is complex because it thinks within the context of empire, but also in terms of of uh, community. Now, anti-colonial nationalism has to be different from imperialist nationalism. And this is, again, the, an old post-colonial problematic, right? This was back to Chatterjee, all of those people were sort of critical of anti-colonial nationalism because it reproduced the structures of domination. So let's examine now how this problematic resonates with contemporary debates in Marxism. And this is where I'll slowly come to, um, to value theory. So Tamil Marxism and recent debates around, around Marxism. So, much of what Mutumon is saying might seem counterintuitive when seen from the standpoint of certain dominant strands of contemporary Marxist theory. 
So there's been a trend in the past few years to stress the global dimension of capitalism and constantly and con consequently pay less attention to unevenness, especially insofar as unevenness appears as an alternative um, or the roots of an alternative. So from this perspective, focus on earlier forms of community to confront capitalism is considered reactionary or potentially fascist. So incidentally, uh, when I was when I mentioned Singara, Singara Vela and um, um, Jivanandam, the Singara, Singara Vela was a little concerned about uh, Tamil identity because you know he's writing in the 30s and 40s he's thought it could lead to fascism. Um, but I and I and I think it, it could, but I don't think that that's that is that is that is that is a necessary uh, development. So in other words, um, if such or if such works uh, identify an evenness, they don't highlight the possibility that this has a possibility of resistance. And this is what I'm thinking of the mainstream kind of Marxist. So recent works, there's a lot of works that stress this kind of global capitalism, and this is often often connected. Um, and now the, how the, we can talk about how the value form fits, fits in here. Now, my own earlier work on Jiang Taiyan uh, actually follows the, the, the more, this, this kind of much, very, very much value theory focused, uh, focusing on Moish Postone who would be one of the, the people who, who really stresses uh, value theory. Uh, and I'm still somewhat indebted, indebted to his work, um, but, uh, but, I, but I'm also a little concerned I have my concerns. So Andy Liu is a recent book on South Asia, uh, both, both South Asia and East Asia, one of the few books that, and often is a very interesting economic history of these two places, but it's very much grounded in this kind of uh, value theory. And he says that basically the suggestions offered in this book is, is, is that the conditions of the possibility of abstract human labor premised uh, theories of value turned upon specific human uh, limitations and determinative so social practice, whether living in Glasgow or Shanghai. So he wants to get, and he's writing in the early 20th, late 19th century, I think. And so it's, you got looking at this kind of a total global picture that again, where unevenness ceases to be that important. Uh, and so then, so is imperialism is not that important either. So this is a tendency to reorient capitalism away from specific class relations to abstract abstraction and a specific theory of value. Right, so you don't really have to, you can have all kinds of forms of labor, but you still have abstract domination. So the, the side effects of all of this is the, the revolutions um, basically were all capitalist. I mean, they didn't, they, there's, not a, there's not a real big, the, 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 whole, the whole socialist movement of the 20th century is now subsumed under, under productivity or capitalism, right? So that you, and this is a, what's, what's great, uh, interesting about this book is it's actually very, in some ways pro, it's trying to argue for the global South saying, hey, wait a second, they're not marginal. They're, they're also capitalists, they're, they're, they're great. So they're, everybody can be happy and be capitalist, right? Uh, and it's a weird place that we that Marxism has got itself into. So, uh, so like the, so it's basically saying, you know, in the most productive years, the gains and in, in uh, so you know the, the gains of of like agriculture really grew, grew right is what he wants to say after the uh, the great leap forward. Um, so the trend, so the, this trend in revisionist histories of the revolution, which try to which rescue them by showing them they they how well they accomplished capitalist goals. In effect, what I say is they take the revolution out of revolution. Now, it's not surprising that this global position has been very easily appropriated by non-Marxist works. Um, and take this example, like global Fordism, right? Which looks at Nazi Germany, Soviet Russia, and, and it also looks at the, compares it to the US. And so if you think about this, um, what it does is it says, well, yeah, I mean, uh, okay, so you've got uh, Soviet Russia, that what it's being socialist ceases to matter anymore. Um, so while these books are laudable in bringing global capitalism into picture, they write as if the socialist movements and imperialism are unimportant. One of the important points in this narrative is not only the downplaying of third world Marxism, but also the whole 20th century socialist experience. And I think these two are connected. Third world Marxism, of course, is in some sense, I mean, it's, 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 an, it's, it's an alternative to, to, to like, Soviet socialism, but, but definitely Chinese socialism was, was a big inspiration there. So against th this emphasis on capitalism, which turns the world into a night in which all cows are capitalist, 
some Marxists have, tr have stressed formal subsumption. And here there's a lot of um, discussion and so now I'll get into what we mean by formal subsumption Marxism. So there's been a trend against the homogen hom homogenizing vision of, of capitalism thus making a space for us to rethink movements such as Tamil Marxism. Some scholars are promoting this term and draw creatively on Marxist concepts of real and formal subsumption. Uh, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but basically, because, because Marx says something very specific about real and formal subsumption, and I think the, the theorists who use this, um, and two I'll mention here, Massimiliano Tomba and Harry Haratunian, um, they're, they're, they're actually using it in a more broad sense. Uh, so initially, the, 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 the specific meaning of it is, is that so formal subsumption is when capitalism first begun, begins, it often makes use of earlier forms of production, right? And it says without changing the character of the actual labor process, um, and the actual mode of working, right? But then eventually, you then get to, uh, in, in one narrative, right, you then revolutionize the actual mode of labor, right, and the real nature of the labor process as a whole. So that's real subsumption, right? So, so, that's, so that's the very specific idea. But I think what's happening uh, with formal subsumption is that we're now beginning to talk about it more as things that cannot be completely subsumed by capital. Um, so the formal subsumption, so many of the formal subsumption theorists, um, and I, as I mentioned, Massimiliano Tomba and Harry Haratunian, they use the term formal subsumption not merely to discuss labor, although that's part of it, um, because you know the Varas Aslich ideas, again, could be considered a formal subsumption, right? Um, but to speak about practices and experiences that are not consumed, subsumed by, by capitalism, right? And this is where it intersects with Chakrabarti's history too, right? Where you have, uh, you know, history one being the history of capital, where, you know, everything leads to capital, but then history two being these, these um, kind of experiences that, that cannot be completely uh, subsumed, right? And these are all themes, I think, in Tamil Marxism. So I've already suggested how such experiences might be part of a socialist project, so I'm not going to talk about that more. Um, so let me summarize here. So through, through referring to formal subsumption, we might see the possibility of constructing different paths out of capitalism by drawing on earlier forms of community. These earlier forms of community might be embedded in texts, traditions, and practices. So there are different kind of ways of thinking about this. Um, to some extent, the right wing is already sort of doing this. I mean, the, you find narrative, much many more narratives of community on the right than you do on the, on the, on the left. Right? Um, and so now I'll conclude. So, so the new, this new version of reading formal subsumption returns us to what we call back to the future narratives, right? Which is, which I see in Mutamohan's Marxism. Um, Tamil Marxism suggests that we might need to rethink empire and nation in relation to socialism. That was the, the Otto Bauer movement, uh, moment. Um, and then, but the back to the future narrative, and now I talked about the limits to this presentation, um, is only the first step in a larger socialist vision, which again has to be informed by a theory of uh, struggle, struggle towards a, a post-capitalist uh, society. Um, but that is a larger question that goes beyond the scope of this talk. And uh, I'll stop there and look forward to your comments. In my experience as a consumer of uh, books about Marxism, uh, there's a tendency that people are either kind of uh, theory heavy or, um, or historical. And I, I really feel like this paper, um, you know, had, had a lot of theory and a lot of history very beautifully intertwined. To some extent, uh, ethnicity, language, class, and caste are all orthogonal. Yeah, you have Brahmins who speak Tamil who have very dark skin, yeah. Um, so, so I'm just curious about like this interest in seeing kind of Dravidians as non-Brahmanical, which of course has a certain you know historical truth to it. There's no doubt, but yeah. like like how how does how does the sort of question of of Tamil speaking Brahmins you know fit fit into this for I don't know either for like. Tamil speaking Brahmins or for Tamil speaking Marxist theorists? Yeah. Well, that's good. I mean, I think that's a great question and, and one that is definitely very close to my heart because I mean, uh, my mother was a Tamil speaking Brahmin. So, 
So, um, you know, and when I go to um, India, I'm often around Tamil speaking Brahmins and then most of them are not, not you know, I don't know if Tamil makes them any more Marxist. But, but, I, think, but I think the question, I, and, I, and I think it, it goes to the heart of the whole movement because <clears throat> what you end up having is a question of what kind of Tamil are you talking about, right? And they start re, um, you know, this, this was something that I didn't get into in the talk, but, um, you know, they began to rethink the language, right? And, and, you know, and since you're a Sanskrit scholar, I mean, you know, it, it really shows, I mean, in, in the use of the, the use, the attempt to avoid Sanskrit, right? Because the whole point of their saying, well, what is the difference between Brahmin, Tamil? And well, first of all, the Brahmins, they have a, they have a bit of a dialect, right? So that's, that's one thing that auto automatically, in fact, I didn't know this because I, I actually started studying Tamil only, you know, maybe a couple of years ago uh, when I started thinking about this project. And, and then it's when I realized that, you know, all the Tamil that I'd heard when I was younger is Brahmin Tamil. It's not, it's not pure Tamil. Um, you know, and the most obvious example is in some of the verb con conjugations, right? right? The minute you say that, they say, oh, are you Brahmin? You know, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and, and the thing is, uh, so you, you avoid all of that and you use indigenous Tamil words and that, but of course, there are obviously Brahmins if they're, because if you really, if you study classical Tamil literature, well, you know, that's what you're, that's the kind of Tamil you're going to get. Um, now this caused all kinds of problems, right? Because, you know, the people who are going to do that and learn all of that are not going to be the masses. Uh, so this is where then G Jiva Nandam had to rethink a lot of this and go back to folk. And so it becomes a really complicated, a really complex question that you begin to have to, uh, you know, really go to a lot of these, uh, you know, you have to go to, you know, folk traditions and so on. And, and in some sense, this is something that, you know, I think there are parallels to the Chinese traditions, right? Right. Because like the Chinese revolution have to keep going, you know, they, they've got this language. Okay. We've got, we've got, you know, plain speech, but then, it's a language that you know the masses are not really that familiar with, and then they have to go back and rethink it, right? And go to um, you know the countrysides and looks you know collect songs and so on. And you know I think there's some of that going on as in in this context as well. But but yeah, it's a, it's a it's a large question. Um, yeah. Uh, well, maybe this transitions kind of smoothly into another question I have, which is sort of the what's the so I won't be able to get this guy's name by Mutumohan. Mut 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 I mean, he sounds like, first of all, just a great Marxist theorist and makes me wish I could be Tamil. Um, well, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe you should get, we should get him translate. Huh. Well, um, I, let's say, I, I think there's a danger with, with, which is sort of related to what we were just talking about, with let's call it high Marxist theory, which is, you yeah, know, the, yeah. you go into a sort of factory and you and you say like, you know, well, Kautsky says this, and Rosa yeah, Luxemburg yeah, yeah, says yeah, this, yeah. and so I wonder what, um, like, like, does he have any kind of concrete revolutionary political vision of like, so this, so in, you know, right here in India right now, we should fight Modi and neoliberalism by doing X. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something I'd have to look into a little more. I mean, because they're all they all have connections to the Communist Party, and so that could be. You know, but this is the big problem with with Marxism is that we are so we are so out of the mainstream that that when you look at po concrete political practices, it becomes almost banal sometimes. I mean, yeah, yeah, that you know that you know, like as you said, I mean, we have to fight Modi. We've got to fight, you know, the Hindu right. Or, you know, but all that, of course, you can connect it to uh, cultural politics, right? Um, what, you know, and we have to, you know, forget, you go against um, the Brahmin elite, you know, because who are very, who are pro-Modi, even though Modi is not a Brahmin, but, but you know, that, so, so there's, there's that, you then, you, you know, it becomes something that, you know, maybe most left liberals would, would probably also agree to. So I think that the big question is going to be, well, how do we, how do we get from there to something further? Right. Um, how do we get from that? How do we link that to a larger movement? And this is where maybe class is going to come in. Maybe the best we can do 
anywhere now is, and you touched on this, is 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 kind of um, finding uh, ways of articulating senses of belonging that are not overtly on the right. Yeah, exactly. uh, and, yeah. and 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 that that you know that that I mean that it's I actually would say that like the the Hindutva movement, you know, saying you know global capitalism is right there in the Rig Veda is is no is a remarkable political if not intellectual achievement you know and that's where i think you guys are oh no but socialism is there you know yeah 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 and, and I, I i sort of like that um and i think yeah i think that is the that is the the real issue that i think that you know we've we've come to a place where and, you know and, and and i think that the modi is is really interesting because there's a nationalism there there's a and and i think that what's happened i think is that the left has had a much and the marxists have had a much more difficult time dealing with nationalism um and i think that's what's that especially happens when we stress global capitalism right that we end up saying and the and and i, I think post-colonialism has done a bit of damage on this too even though you know they're because because they are so much about deconstructing the nation too right so that we've deconstructed the nation so much that it, it becomes much much easier for the right to just take have a monopoly on on the nation form, and I think that that is something that, you know, has very I think the left has only recently begun to realize that right that 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 it really needs uh, you know it's I think in 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 Indian Marxist circles I think the problem of caste was also neglected, uh, and that I think is again some a, a reason why. Tamil Marxism is, you know, has a slightly better track record, perhaps, because of the whole history of Periyar and the whole that movement. There was a there was a little more of consciousness, and I think, you know, and we should also note that the South, definitely Tamil Nadu and Kerala, have, have always been a little more resistant to to Modi, right, uh, and the BJP. I mean, there's actually elections going on in Coimbatore right now, so. Um, you know, and, and they're trying to mobilize against, you know, to keep the keep the DMK. I mean, which is against both, uh, you know, Congress and and the BJP. I'll throw a, a, a very specific question at you, which is uh, w when you're talking about value form analysis. To me, that 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 makes me think immediate, immediately of uh, Michael Heinrichs and the kind of Neue Marx lectura. It, like, is it, am, am I right? Mikhail Heinrich is one of them. Um, I think, um, yeah, Mikhail Heinrich for sure. You know, there's the whole the Neumark lecture, lectura, and uh, you know, Postone is the one I I know best because I I was very influenced. I I am very influenced by his work. Um, it's not in this, but I mean, I think, and if I were to continue and say, you know, where do we go from here? Where what does what does any politics of tradition have to deal with and keep in mind, it's going to be some of the things he was talking about, like the changing composition of capital and those kind of things, right? Um, but you're right, I, I do, I think that the, the there, but there are many issues connected to value Marx, value, value theory Marxism. I mean, it's really the focus on the value form uh, and those first three chapters of capital. Um, and the question, I think a lot of questions is how do we understand those? I think how do we think of those in terms of the larger society are those are those you know kind of social forms that that unproblematically become global right so that my question is I, when we talk about global capitalism we also have to think about how it globalizes it sounds like for you the or maybe maybe the issue is um in you know when we move from concrete labor to abstract labor what like what is the actual sort of what, what is the actual social practice that that uh, implements that abstraction and and how global is 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 that a, a very sort of rough and ready critique of of the the ccp in the 1950s is they were like well you know uh uh like as long as we believe, you know, strongly enough, we don't actually have to worry about, you know, what what agriculture outputs really are. So, so I think there's on, yeah, on yeah. the one on the one hand, I think everyone thinks there is there's some sort of fundamental material uh, determination of of societies, 
But on the other hand, it, it, it seems like you're saying it's very, it's very easy for even Marxists in thinking about value theory to, to, to universalize and dehistoricize the, the, the categories of capitalist abstraction. That- yeah, yeah, I think I think that's part of it. I think, you know, and you mentioned Mikhail Heinrich and I, I because my Mikhail Heinrich, I would think of the many the, the people I've read and I, you know, I can't say I've read all of them. Uh, he's one of the most careful. Um, and and I think that uh, because, you know, he there are a lot of conflations uh, that I think some of the, the others make that that he doesn't. Uh, and so the, the first one is the relationship between capitalism and market. So that if you think about Postone, uh, one of the things he wants to say is that there is no, uh, you know, that, that you can have capitalism without a market. And that then allows you to have, to talk about state and capitalism. Right, and so, th- and this is the reason why, because because the value form is 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 something that can operate without the market, right? So that is that is the point that, that he wants to make. Now Heinrich doesn't go there, right? So Heinrich steps back from making that. So that so there, that's one thing is just just the relationship, you know, between like market and capitalism, and and you know, but when you make that distinction, well, then you get into another issue, which is you know, what is the status of those first three chapters of Capital, right? Uh, when he's talking, when Marx is talking about exchange, right, and things like that, and he says that you don't have the category of wage labor yet. So then the question is, how do we, are those, you know, this is, I, I'm here, I'm influenced by a, a French uh, Marxist named uh, Jacques Bidet, who, who, you know, he has a very interesting theory that the first three chapters, in some sense, are talking about the market, but without, without capitalism yet, you know, and then when, then you have a chapter that is about the transformation of, of money into capital, and then you get capital. But then, then that makes a very interesting shift between these two. And, the, and then there's a political moment, you know, which is about you know, the, the, the boundaries of capital, right? And that is a, there's a political problem there and that gets us to the nation and the state. And I think the real, the real problem is, is, is a very old problem in Marxism. And that is how do you theorize the state? You know, since Ralph Miliband and Polan Saz, we've been we've been talking about that, and it's it's and and I think what what's very interesting about value theory Marxism is that it's able to it almost in many cases and I, and here again Heinrich, you know he's got an essay he's got I've got an essay on the state and stuff which is okay which which we again sees the problem, um, but but I think, but I think often the value form almost tries to trump the state and say well the state is also an expression because bureaucracy is also an expression of the value form. Uh, and then I think then then we're in some trouble. I think um, um, so. That's one thing. The other the other problem is the globalization of capital again is connected to the state because that's how you can theorize imperialism, right? While often the value theory Marxists will say, well, no, the imperialism is not that not that important um, because it's a secondary kind of thing, right? The, the real thing is capitalism. I think the, the real issue, um, as I was trying to present it, is really a question of, you know, how can we, can we draw on identity politics for, in, 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 for Marxism? And I think that that's, that's really an important um, issue for us because so much of the liberal left, you know, and in some sense, the right are also are, are all connected with identity politics. Because if you think about Modi, there's a kind of identity politics with him too. It's a Hindu identity. And it's a Hindu identity politics that's sort of connected to a kind of neoliberal uh, project. And w- what's so great about that is an ideology is that it can get people, it can get different people, right? You can have people who are my relatives in, in, in India who, who, who will support Modi because of the economic stuff, right? Uh, and, you know, well, you know, all that, you know, anti-Muslim, that's not really serious. It's just, you know, there he's really about developing the economy, right? But, um, but, then, but then you can also have those who are sort of anti-imperialist, who can also support Modi. Uh, and this is what's really mind-boggling because he's so pro-American in some ways. Uh, I mean, we'll have to see what he does with the Russia, Russian issue. You know, there are a lot of people who are, you know, sort of, 
pro sort of Indian identity and maybe a bit anti-West who also can support Modi. So, so he's able to grasp these two, right, these two sides. More broadly, I guess, you know, we can, if we think about the way people are rallying around race and so on like that and things like that, the question for Marxism is can we then, you know, connect that to a larger kind of movement that, that has a vision that goes beyond just affirming identity so that so that somehow affirming identity has to be connected to something broad, broader. And, and so that's where you're gonna to have to really rethink what, what identity means, right? There was a little discussion in the papers uh, after the publication of volume three, where basically, you know, various people, most famously Bomvarek, were sort of waiting to say like, ah, this is just all nonsense. And now that volume three is out, we can tell, yeah. And, yeah. and a lot of that centered around this, um, this transition. I don't remember exactly where it happens in Capital, but where, where he's like, okay, you know, we have the whole thing with the, <laughs> it's so funny actually though, though like the weaver who sells, yeah, yeah, you yeah, buys yeah. the yeah. Bible and, you know, and, and like you said, there's no wage labor in that whole discussion. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I think it's, it's clear that Engels thought, and one of the positive viewers thought that at least this is just a sort of um, a kind of methodological progression where yeah. we where we're introducing different you know determinations, and so we say, okay, well, here's the commodity, which and his description of the commodity comes straight out of Adam Smith, right? And yeah. then um, and and then at some and then you have each of these sort of turns of the screw, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. the you know the interesting thing actually is that you know in simple commodity exchange then then at least in theory uh, commodities will sell at their labor values right and so it's actually this this the the introduction of the movement of capital investments across sectors yeah. is what throws things off of their labor values so it's actually linked to the transformation problem yeah, um yeah, yeah. and 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 then this reviewer had said okay this is great th theory but you know, it's it's just a it's just a an, an analytical device, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But then Engels uh, wanted to say, no, no, no. Like historically speaking, like commodity markets were free and labor markets were free before capital markets were free. So right. this is not a a, a, a theoretical thing it's a it's actual historical process and has a discussion oh, about like you know which societies he thinks um had you know like like where in history in terms of time and space can we actually find simple commodity uh, uh yeah 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 so so that is a big yeah. debate and i think and i think a lot of people were sort of critical of that, uh, of it being historical. Um, and I think that's how value theory came. Because the, 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 the thing about the value theory reading uh, that's sort of interesting is that it's, it's very Hegelian. And for that, I should sort of like it. But, um, but, but I, think, I think Bidet has a point um, when he says, you know, one of the things like you mentioned with the weaver and so on, if you look at that first chapter, a lot of it is it's it's artisanal labor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's people coming in. It's almost if you think about it, it's like, you know, I was just uh, reading some work by by a guy named uh, as he's a Renaissance historian named uh, uh, Michael Martoccio, uh, and it's all about markets in the 12th century in Italy, and then Bidet draws on this as well. Uh, but there you see you have markets. But it's not a it's not capitalist markets. They're like there's there there's uh, there's another logic that's that's working there, and it almost mm -hmm. seems like he's he's getting that. I mean, it's not quite being historical, although it, there could be historical places where this there, there's something close to that. Um, but of course, once you get into the history, then you've got to get into a lot of the externalities that are there. Like there's maybe a, an idea of honor that's influencing the value. And and interestingly, and this I only know from Martoccio's work, and that is that. You know, there's they could actually they were actually selling places. You could actually sell sovereignty, right? But 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 that's but also that's also relevant because 
by the time you get to the third, you know, fourth, fifth chapters, you, you begin to already get an enclosed space where capitalism is taking place, right? So that, so that you begin to get the boundaries of capital and, and laws, right? And, and, and things like that, that, that come in. And, and a lot of you know, Marx's work in, is, is really happening in that abstraction. Right. In, yeah, in well, that. I mean, he was quite explicit about this methodology. Yeah. He says, you know, I'm assuming yeah. away all exactly. foreign countries. Exactly. So I don't think that's... No, no, you know, no. I, that's, yeah. not, that's not a problem. I mean, it's something that comes up at the end, right? When you get yeah, you know, you prim the various primitive... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, but, and, and, and I think the other point that you made, I made with the transformation problem is also important, right? Because there is the idea that things are selling at their value. Uh, and, and that's a big, that's a big, uh, a, a big issue. You know, because value is socially necessary labor time, right? And that's a that's a difficult idea to think about in real life. And I remember when I was writing my dissertation. So the first book was really uh, was something that my my advisor came. You know, I was in my advisor's office. He didn't like all this value theory, and he said, he goes, you know, but how do you explain the price of a chateau Lafitte? You know. Oh, Which that's a has, monopoly price. That doesn't that's that doesn't have to be covered by value theory. But uh. <laughs> yeah. and then he goes, "What about what about my my daughter wants a Gucci bag?" You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. There are all these things. And so the problem is that it's so value and price, and and because the, you know you go to the economics department and they're only interested in price. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They don't they don't price and value are the same for them, right? And so. So then you've got to ex sort of explain that no, what he's not, he's not interested in sort of predicting prices, but he's trying to get at a logic of society, right? Yeah, and I think uh, not, not interested is exactly the right way of putting it. That, because this is what like, when, you know, when I, when, when I, when I, I don't know, when I run into people and they're like, what, you're reading Marxist technology? Well, it's, all, it's all wrong because it can't predict prices. It's like, you know, we, you don't become a Marxist to play the stock market, you know? So getting back to what you were saying. Yeah. It sounds like that the strong implication of Marx's presentation is that capitalism is a form of, is, is a mode of production among many that are compatible with the market. And right. that the, the implication then is if you don't have a market, that's not capitalism. And so that's what I always, you know, when I read this kind of state capitalist literature, I always think, why don't we just call this a different mode of production? You know, I mean, maybe it's a small point, but no, no, that's an important um, point because because uh, when you call it capitalist, you seem to be legitimating it. See, that's the weird thing about our world today. That you know, like like Andy Liu's book. I mean, he's it's 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 pro China, right? And and this was the thing because I uh, this was one of the things that was very interesting when I brought uh, Moish Stone to China, right? And uh, and we had a you know, we had a discussion with a lot of Chinese leftists, right? And he was, you know, talking about his theory of value, the value form, and all that stuff, and global capitalism, and all of that. And and he talked about China, and he was trying to praise China. And he says, you know, Mao made a great contribution to China by being such a good capitalist. You know, yeah, yeah. and and they're and they're furious, right? And he <laughs> yeah, says, I understand. He's like, he's like, no, I'm no, I'm praising, I'm praising Mao, you know, and 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 you know that is the it's it's a lot of it has to do with that whole idea of, you know, state capitalism. Now I'm really in an area I don't know anything about, but I think that's kind of close to the reigning ideology, right? Is that like, you know, you know, Deng realized that we needed to to to. Um, release the potential of the, the forces of production, and that means a little more primitive accumulation. Thank you very much, and uh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, uh, yeah. and everything will be fine in in twenty fifty when we when we actually move when we when 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 our when we've had enough capitalism to move to socialism, right? So I think that that would sort of imply that to the extent that Maoism was a success, it you know it, I think you know I think Dung and and she would would agree with Pistone then, you know, that's yeah, my... Yeah, sort of, yeah, sort of. In some ways they would, I think, um, you know, and unlike the Orthodox Maoist who wants to say that there was something else in... in yeah, Maoist. yeah, yeah. And and so this, you know, the narrative of the Cultural Revolution, right, that says, you know, you want it. And that, that I think, you know, that narrative, I think, is sort of, you know, India, India is interesting to bring into this because India sort of goes in, in two different ways. There's the Indian, there's some... You know, branch. I think now the CPIM is really pro-China, 
uh, I think even yeah yeah more because they so then they they end up having to say that China even today is sort of is sort of socialist right uh, or at least not capitalist you know something something along those lines so they're going and I think that you know the the Maoist party you know the, the, there's a there's a there's a communist party that leans towards Mao right and they would be much more you know that no no there's they're very anti-contemporary China right yeah. and so that so I think that kind of thing is is still so the new left is is in China is a different is a difficult kind of beast because they they're somewhat you know when it comes to China America relations they're very pro China but they're also pro Mao in a way that you know they want to keep that as a vantage point to criticize the present and i think that what postone was doing is sort of almost taking taking the rug out from under yeah 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 i see that yeah because and and i think that and i think that that's really you know this whole idea of you know whether the soviet union and china and communist china were both capitalist i mean that really takes away the whole 20th century uh, socialist movements right because then with that, all third world Marxisms go, right? Because they're all just state-centered modes of capitalist um, accumulation, right? Who that, that didn't understand the value form.